project of the Messy Reformation. My name's Jason Rice. I'm the lead pastor at Faith Community CRC in Beaver Dam, Wisconsin. My co-host is Willie Cronkey. He's a member at PCRC in Pease, Minnesota. We're just a couple of guys who love the Christian Reformed Church and want to see Reformation happen in our denomination. But we realize that whenever Reformation happens in the history of the church, things get messy. And boy, are they starting to get messy now in the Christian Reformed Church after this past synod. So we're taking the opportunity to have conversations with pastors throughout the Christian Reformed Church to find out what's going on in our denomination, but also to talk about what Reformation might look like. And for the next few months, we're going to focus particularly on delegates from this past synod to talk about what just happened and where we might be going in the future. If you haven't already, take a moment, click subscribe so you don't miss any of our upcoming content. We are dropping episodes every single Monday. We also want to say we feel so blessed by everyone who sponsored us on Patreon. We've had some really generous donors lately, and we are so thankful. And we're getting really close to our goal of 20 sponsors at $5 a month. So if you appreciate what we're doing and want to help us continue to put out content, head on over to patreon.com backslash The Messy Reformation. We've also created a Facebook page where we're putting out additional content, and we'd love for you to find us there at facebook.com backslash The Messy Reformation. Like our page for more updates. With all that said, we're going to get to this week's episode, which is part one of Synod Reflections by Corey Naderveld. So, Corey, why don't you just kick us off? Tell us a little bit about yourself, your church, and uh, your family. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, Jason and Willie. It's so good to to be with you guys. My name is Corey Naderveld. Uh, I'm a husband to my high school sweetheart, Jackie. We've been married for for 17 years. We have three boys, Logan, who's 13, Hunter, who's 11, and uh, Dylan, who's eight. And uh, they keep us very, very busy. They're social boys and they, they play sports and all kinds of extracurriculars. And yeah, this this summer, like even this week, just driving them back and forth to football camp and all kinds of stuff. So uh, busy time of life and summer. I, th- I always think it's going to be a little bit of a break and proves to be <laughs> even busier. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, I'm one of the pastors at Hillcrest CRC. There's, there's two full-time pastors and one part-time uh, located in Hudsonville, Michigan. Uh, that's halfway between Grand Rapids and Holland, if you're not familiar with, with West Michigan. Um, so, and I'm working kind of as uh, in a hybrid role, really. It's uh, like I said, I'm one of the pastors, but also serve as the youth pastor for the church. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, a solo pastor for, for just over three years in Grand Haven, Michigan. Uh, and before that, I was a youth director like yourself, Jason. I was a youth director uh, and a commissioned pastor at Cottonwood CRC in Jenison. I was there for uh, about 12 years. Uh, so Grand Haven really was the, the furthest I ventured away from home, and, and that's only about 30 minutes away from where I grew up. Right now, I'm sitting about three blocks from my childhood home oh, wow. uh, in Hudsonville. So my kids are seventh generation Hudsonville. Um, so deep roots in this community, this little corner of uh, West Michigan it used to be a very rural town. Now it's kind of becoming more of a suburb of Grand Rapids as Grand Rapids just continues to to just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And all these farm fields are turning into subdivisions. So really a bedroom community of Grand Rapids now. So um, that been at my current call for uh, about two years now. Okay. So. And then you grew up in the CRC then? I did not. No, I grew up in the RCA uh, in Hudsonville here. A very wonderful conservative church. It was a daughter church of Hudsonville Reform. Uh, sadly closed its doors about 15 years ago. And actually, uh, I drive by it on the way to and from work, and they just tore the building down. They built it in like 1995. The, the newest sanctuary just was amazing, beautiful, beautiful, big sanctuary. Uh, and the church quickly took a downturn and, and closed. In the last couple of years, uh, the sanctuary was actually a weight room for the public school. 
Um, really? So, so the sanctuary, they wow. took all the pews out. There was AstroTurf in it. Um, you know, really sad. It's just a building, but there's just, you know, all the memories of the people yeah. in there and my wedding, my dad's funeral, you know, baptisms, all that stuff, uh, you know, happened in that place. So they just tore it down. So uh, yeah, grew up in the RCA, came to the CRC in 2006. I was sensing a call to ministry. It was um, looking at leaving the RCA, looking for uh, a more conservative denomination. I talked to an OPC church and a CRC church, and uh, I think the deciding factor was the CRC church got back to me quicker, um, hmm. honestly. <laughs> so I was kind of between those two at that time, um, and uh, it was just that's where I went to when I went to Cottonwood and was there for for 12 years. So just, uh, yeah, so I've been in the CRC for uh, 16 years now. Wow. Yeah, that's awesome. So you were in youth ministry then, or your first call to youth ministry was 12 years. Yes. Yeah, yeah. it was. And I was in that church and I thought I was going to continue to to be there. They they put me through seminary and um, it's just a wonderful experience. And so I'm back in this area and a lot of good friends still from that church. Oh, awesome. Corey, where actually did you go to seminary? Went to Calvin Seminary. Okay. How was your uh, how was your tenure at Calvin when you were there? It was good. I actually I had dabbled at Western Seminary, the RCA Seminary, just because I had grown up in it, and as far as I knew knew it was as conservative and orthodox as my RCA church, and so only took a couple of classes there and uh, and put seminary on pause. And my church said, "We think you should continue to do seminary, and we would like to commission you as a pastor." Uh, so they encouraged Calvin Seminary, and so uh, I I didn't want to do online, so that was the other seminary that was in proximity, and and was grateful for the the support to go there. So it it was a step in the right direction after leaving Western, and uh, that just wasn't a good fit for me at Western. So at the time, I I, I thought Calvin was good, and kind of as I got deeper into it. I, I did struggle at times. Um, there was, we've, you, you've talked about this before on the podcast, so I don't want to rehash all of it, but there wasn't the, the doctrinal emphasis that I, that I really had hoped for. And um, the preaching classes kind of left something to be desired. In fact, when I got out, I, I took an online uh, class from Covenant Seminary, just it was just like a audit type thing, just because I wanted to supplement my preaching a little bit more. So I nothing overly negative to say about Calvin. I had some wonderful professors that challenged me there. I loved Dr. Wyman. He was my mentoring group leader as well. So you you got to get into heavier stuff, even in mentoring group with, with Wyman. And uh, so I loved that. Um, so overall, good experience. But yeah. Yeah. And that's how we first connected. Actually, mm -hmm. Here, the funny thing is, is we were in seminary at the same time. And then we were on, we went on a Turkey and Greece trip with Dr. Wyma. And so we were together on this trip for two weeks and Corey and I never talked or connected <laughs> until the very last night of the trip. While me and one of my buddies were going to wander around Athens on the last night. We're like, Oh, we'll wander around a little bit. And we met Corey on the way out and he's like, well, I'd like to come with too. And so sure, come on, wander around with us. And then all of a sudden we noticed that we had youth ministry and we had so many things in common. I was like, goodness gracious, we've been here two weeks and we haven't even talked until the last night. Slackers. But. It was, well, we were like, what a shame that was, but it really just boiled down to the fact that we sat in different parts of the bus, right? And the, yeah. <laughs> once you pick your seat, you never move. So you were up near the front yeah. of the bus and I was in the back of the bus. And yeah, eventually we're like, I wish we would have met earlier in this. Yeah, trip, for but. sure. Well, and it happened like I was a distance student. So yeah. I, hung out with, I, me and my buddy were the only distance students. So we yeah. didn't know anybody. And so we just kind of hung out together, but um, that was stupid. We should have, <laughs> we should have worked on that more before that. So, but it's been good kind of to build on that relationship. Yeah. And now, now we've been able to, we both got to serve together now at Synod, which is what we kind of want to dive into a little bit yep. more um, in the rest of this episode. So uh, what advisory committee did you serve on at Synod? Yeah, so I was on advisory committee number one. So that was the the Canada U.S. stuff, right? The, the oh, structure yeah. and leadership. <clears throat> um, you know, getting into that, it was 
there was a lot more pain than I had realized. And, and, and I probably should have been more in touch with that. I probably should have uh, understood a little bit more the Canadian side of, of what they've, you know, they felt like there wasn't autonomy or that their, their voice was marginalized within the denomination. I, I didn't realize a lot of that. Um, so it was, it was a tough committee in one sense uh, yeah. because of the pain that was in the room. And there was a lot of, a lot of Canadians on the committee and a lot of, a lot of people with dual citizenship actually, or had served churches in both Canada and the U S. So that was really interesting um, uh, for me just to hear their perspective. And so it was tough for that reason. It was also tough because it's, it was such a moving target. You know, we had all this time between synods and so much had developed on this front, yeah. right? The structure and leadership task force salt as it's known as, um, and really, if you started reading, you know, to, to 2020, what they were proposing, and then 2021, it changed, and then it radically changed again, right before Synod. So as you're working through all your materials for your committee, you're realizing that, that this thing is still evolving as we're sitting here t- talking mm-hmm. about it. Yep. And the Council of Delegates, things that even changed the month before Synod, uh, what they were proposing. So um so it was tough for that reason too it was such a moving target i will say though uh it, by the time it made it to the floor of synod there was very little discussion on yeah. the floor of synod people read we read through it they heard it and they kind of nodded their heads and like, yeah that makes sense what else would we do but it was a lot of work to get to that point and to make it that clear where we could have nodding heads and that that really was uh a, a a lot of credit goes to our chair and the committee that served. It was, for me, it was just an education and how to take a really complex problem and work through it with good processes and, and have a chair that was able to, to get opinions from everybody and come to a good final product. So I've never been on a committee that, that operated that well. We, in fact, we had somebody on, on our committee who has been ascended many times before, and he said he's never had one go so well. Wow. Um, so I, you know, besides even the final product, which we were grateful for, just to be a part of that process was, I think, helpful for my leadership as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, how many times have you been to Synod, Corey? This was my first one. Oh, so, I had a feeling. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you got 1,400 pages of agenda uh, for your first one. So it's, I think probably had I had a previous experience, that would have been more intimidating than going in just not knowing what to expect at all. So, yep. I mean, to me, that's just what Synod probably always is, right? It's always that much material and that much work. Um, so if I ever go, if the Lord ever calls me to go again, uh, I doubt it'll be after a three-year hiatus and with such weighty matters before us. So yeah, I, it was one of, it's been one of the really just curious things for me looking at this synod because I don't have the numbers, but just from experience, the number of people I talked to that were first time delegates to synod to this momentous synod, every, I think everybody knew this was going to be a synod that was going to, it's like a watershed moment for the CRC. And uh, the fact that we sent so many first time delegates, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Why? I'm not totally sure. I do feel like something that I had heard and felt and kind of sensed was part of it is a generational shift. So just by virtue of so many younger leaders haven't been pastors for very long. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, we're just a few years out of seminary and I think that's part of it. And, or maybe it's partially just those that have been many times didn't want to bite off this much. So they needed people who are naive and (laughs) could gladly (laughs) step into this. Um, I think a combination of factors, but I've, I haven't thought about that a ton, but it it was kind of an interesting phenomenon. Yeah, it was, it was really interesting, but I think you're right. I think, uh, you know, I've, I've heard the, like people, the older veterans were like, you guys just go take care of this. We're going to stay out of it. But I do think, um, I think it's a good point that it, this could be just reflective of a generation of the generational shift that we saw, because a lot of people saw that. And uh, there, there's this generational shift going on in our denomination. And the younger people 
are the the consistently more conservative people. Yeah. Um, and so I talked to a number of of people, um, even I think outside of this podcast, who said when I saw somebody get up to speak from the mic and they were a younger person and outside there, there are some pretty well-known progressive young, younger pastors in the CRC, like five of them. Um, but outside those five, if I saw a younger person get up, I knew that they were going to be promoting these kind of conservative values. And it, I guess it's nice for me to hear. I'd be curious from your perspective as a, as a youth pastor for so long. And, and now I kept saying, I keep, I kept noticing that the younger people in our churches were, were wanting to be more conservative and the older people in our churches were wanting to kind of be more seeker sensitive and all of that kind of stuff. And the younger people were saying, just teach us the Bible. That's what we want, right? Teach us God's word and disciple us in it. And so it's interesting to see now that generational shift moving up and, and affecting the denomination. That's absolutely the dynamic. One of the things I didn't mention in, when I was introducing myself is I also run uh, a young adult ministry, right? This is a, a separate nonprofit that I, I do in conjunction with several other churches, CRC churches and a, a former RCA church, which is now ARC. And in the last two, three years, uh, this ministry has grown. And the, the, the reason it grew, I think, is because I stopped trying to youth pastor them in some ways and just said, we're going to open God's word. We're going to, we're going to be fed at the table. You got to feed young adults. Right. But other than that, we just open the Bible and I give them a Bible study guide and they just want to know what it says. They, they don't want to play games. They just want to know what God's word says, help me understand it. And so there is a whole generation of leaders in the church, lay leaders, not just ordained people, but lay leaders who are serving in their communities that want to, to live out God's truth and, and care deeply about God's word. So despite the claims that this synod was made, it was decisions made by old white men, I would say it, it was, it was the conservative perspective was more diverse. If you think of the Korean council and uh, the Latino contingent that, that was represented there, um, I wish we could have heard from the Navajo and some others a little bit more, but by and large, the ethnic minorities were more orthodox and the young delegates were, were more orthodox. And I would consider myself still a young delegate. I was on a youth trip uh, last week and uh, I reminded them that I'm a millennial and they found it important to remind me that even though I'm a millennial, I'm born between 1980 and 1985, and that's now known as geriatric millennials. Oh, oh ouch. <laughs> ouch. I never heard that term. Uh, I, I don't know if I want to own either. that term. It, I, I'd heard elder millennial, but then I Googled it, and sure enough, in the last few years, they switched from elder millennial to geriatric millennial. Ouch. So, yeah, But I still consider myself young. So. Yeah, you're the yeah. disenfranchised bunch. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, and I'm uh, – so I fall in that same geriatric millennial, too, because I've, I've, I'm willing to claim the millennial tag. That's fine because I don't necessarily fit with the millennial yeah, stereotypes. Same. But um, it's – yeah, age is a is a is a relative thing, right? I remember a number of years ago, uh, we were at a church wide retreat, and my back had been acting up or something. And I got up and I was really stiff and I was kind of hunched over and I was like, "Ah, oh, man, I'm old." And there was a a young or not a young, an old lady from our church who was in her 80s, and she reamed me a new one. She said, "You don't even say anything about being old. You are just a young whippersnapper. Don't even pretend like it." And I was like, "Okay, oh, yeah, good point." <laughs> and so, yeah, when I when I, we're in that age, right, where you talk to teenagers, and they're like, "You're super old," and then you talk to older people, and they're like, "You're super young." And it's like, "Yeah, we're middle aged, I guess that <laughs> that fits." That's in my hybrid role. Like, I don't know whether I'm too old for the youth and too young to be a pastor, or if I'm just right, I, I haven't figured that out yet, but I think at our age, we often feel caught in between. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But, but anyways, to kind of get back to, I, I think part of the reason why the younger yeah. generation is wanting this discipleship is because we're growing up in this kind of post-Christian culture, right? And so they're, for one, they're on the one hand, they're just wrestling with all of this or being taught so many different things and they just want to know how to handle it, how to wrestle through it. 
But on the other hand, I also have said quite a bit that I think they're seeing they're seeing the just the fluff that they're being taught that there's just nothing there. And uh, even my, my kids use the analogy that they were listening. <laughs> this probably sounds super negative, but pastors, kids, I guess they're like, we were listening to somebody talk and we couldn't even call it fluff. It was like air. There was like no substance <laughs> to anything that was coming out of their mouth. And, uh, and so in contrast to that, when they hear us kind of standing firm on God's word and truth and, and kind of rooting things in creation, they realize there's some weight and there's something substantial there and, and they're looking for that. Yeah, I, I think part of this, guys, also speaks to the fact that, I mean, I'm, I'm probably 10 years younger than both of you, so I, I can probably speak to this a little stronger. Uh, people that are my age or a little bit younger have been the fruit and the product of true discipleship that I think the generation above us completely missed out on. Um, all of that vision was completely lost and cast aside, and it's now being taken up by people who are about, about your guys' age, and you've been pouring into us for so long, and I think that's why we've seen so many younger delegates with such conservative, mm. orthodox, confessional voices. What do you guys think? Yeah, amen. I, I think uh, it, it's encouraging, right, for us geriatric millennials <laughs> to, uh, to be seeing the, the fruit of, our fa- of this ministry, because I don't know if you're in the same place as I am, Corey, but I've said this, not to like, just keep bashing the church I grew up in, but I just felt like I was not discipled. And I graduated and I just didn't really know God's word. I didn't really know. And it's not all on them. It's on me too. But, but there wasn't a real solid discipleship program in place. And so when I became a youth pastor, I started doing youth ministry the way that youth pastors did things and then became convicted. That was actually from the synod floor. I mentioned how being rebuked was kind of turning points in my life while people rebuked me for not using God's word or teaching it. And I, we kind of changed our youth ministry. And now, you know, that was almost 15 years ago now for me. And now to see, start seeing the fruit from that ministry, it takes a long time. It does. And a lot of what's been happening, I think in the CRC is the fruit of just long, faithful uh, pastoral ministry. Yeah. I, there's some parallels in my story to, to your youth ministry journey and discipling young people, young young adults. So I, I mean, I, I felt like I got it a little bit in my church and it was there and it was kind of, you go to catechism. Um, we actually had a separate night for catechism for a long time. I think we came on like Monday nights, came back for catechism uh, and we had Sunday school and I was thankful for that. It was more when they made a shift away from that. Uh, we were losing a lot of young people to Mars Hill. Rob, Rob Bell's church at the time was mm-hmm. the, the one that just kind of blew up and just eviscerated the reformed and Christian reformed churches in the area, because here's this dynamic, engaging speaker. uh, And we were losing people. And so then there's this panic, right? We got to try to entertain and do a little bit better. And that was actually the wrong impulse. And so uh, I really caught on fire when I went to Bible college. um, And even though I didn't walk away a premillennial dispensationalist from that fundamentalist school, uh, they had such a high view of God's word. And so then I got so excited about that. And when I eventually um, was, was clear about God's call to ministry and started pouring in uh, and looked for a position and, and did that work, I almost was a little bit overboard at first. And people are like, you're, you're going over people's heads. You're going too hard. Like bring it to their level. Yes. We, we're glad you're excited about it. Um, so I had to kind of learn to do the fun and games stuff and, and find that mix for me. Um, but it wasn't till year seven, year eight, somewhere in there that I was starting to see the fruit of that uh, in the students I was serving. And I'm still seeing the fruit of some of that from 16 years ago. I'm doing uh, weddings, you know, for these kids that are now kids. I call them kids. They're, they're Willie's age, right? Um, I'm doing these weddings and uh, I get to do premarital counseling and just see where they're at and see like what, what they're looking for in a church. And uh, it's just been really good to, to see that and to see them take that seriously and look for a church that's proclaiming God's word and, yeah. and s- s- firmly on the gospel. Amen. Yeah. And I think as I look back to this kind of, there was this movement happening in youth ministry about, mm-hmm. you know, 10, 12 years ago or, you know, 15 or so. And uh, I've told people, one of the crazy things is, is as I, 
I, I remember just slowly starting to run into youth pastors who are being convicted that we need to change the way we do youth ministry. But none of them were convicted by the same person. It wasn't like there was one voice. It was like just a movement of the Holy Spirit. I really, yeah. I really have felt that, that there was this movement of the Spirit saying we need to do youth ministry different. And I feel like God's been, for the last 15 years, been kind of plowing the ground and planting the seed and really kind of, I've said, I feel like little tremors. I'm not, I'm not going to say I'm a prophet here, but in that sense of the word, but I've been feeling like these tremors that God's kind of raising up a generation for some form of reformation or something, because the, this younger group has been, the seeds have been planted, God's doing a work and, uh, and they're kind of mm -hmm. fed up with what the world's been teaching them. And so who knows if or when that'll happen, but I've been seeing this kind of movement happening. And I think it's a, a work of God in the church. That's right. I mean, youth ministry, it, it needed to move beyond Mountain Dew, pizza, video games, and pies in the face. Not that there's anything wrong yeah. with those things, but it just, it just, it was either like become about something real or the youth ministry was over, right? It was just going to die out. Uh, and some churches experience that, right? They just, yeah. their, their, their young people just went somewhere else where they were going to get fed. Uh, and so it just had to do that. And, but I think part of it is, you know, I, I talked about the fruit, but for all these wonderful case studies I could give you of young adults that are walking with the Lord and now discipling their own children in the Lord, I could also tell you, and it still hurts, students who have walked away from the church. And I don't know if you've had that too, Jason, but yeah. but like that's what makes this that much more critical, right? Is yeah. they have so many more forces on them than even when you and I started in youth ministry. And that does make me sound geriatric, I know. But, you know, I, I told you I had a, a long stint in youth ministry. I was away from it as a solo pastor, and now I'm in a hybrid role. And part of it's post-COVID, right? Things have changed the way people interact. Uh, students have, the way they interact with each other is different. But it is it is a different time. Yeah, It, it is the, the messaging that's coming at them in 2022 is so much different than 2006, yeah. When I started. And so it, that's made it that much more critical, I think, as well. Um, but Christ promised he'd build his church and the true church is being built. And I'm so thankful to see so many young pastors and so many young people walking in the truth. And that should be an encouraging thing. And that's that's a big thing I took away from Synod and seeing yeah. younger delegates. Yeah, amen. And that kind of leads to the next question. Uh, one of the things that I've talked about is you know, we're asking everybody what was encouraging about mm. Synod. And that was one of the encouraging things that I saw were yeah. um, younger men and younger men than I am and younger men and women and whatever, just younger mm -hmm. delegates uh, serving and serving faithfully and serving well. It wasn't like we had a bunch of young, young people who were, you know, just being crazy. No, they were really deliberate and focused and, and kind of pouring their heart and soul into it. But what, what were some of the other things that were encouraging to you at Synod? Yeah. So yeah, we mentioned that, that it was younger um, ethnic minorities. Again, that was, uh, you know, just to see them be clear and unwavering in, in their biblical fidelity. Yeah. Uh, it's one of those amazing things. As we grow my, more diverse, we actually are growing more orthodox. So I was very encouraged by that. Um, but a big thing for me was, you know, just as a conservative CRC pastor, uh, you know, just to get there and realize that I'm not alone in the yeah. CRC, you know, for some reason I had that, that narrative just built up in my head that I was, you know, an endangered species uh, <laughs> in the CRC. Yeah. Um, but, you know, God had already started to change that narrative a little bit uh, in the, the previous year. I mean, you go back a year and a half and I just thought there's no way I retire from this denomination. I just, yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't see a way forward. Um, but God started to change that narrative. And honestly, you know, thanks to you guys and the platform you've given on the Messy Reformation uh, to pastors so that I could hear those voices. And I've thanked you for that before, Jason. And I want to thank you again on this, you and Willie. You know, without that, you know, that sparked something, you know, to just realize that, that I'm not alone, you know, and then that work continued, uh, it continues through the Messy Reformation, but also the Abide Project and just networking with other pastors and office bearers uh, to realize that, that, again, I'm not this endangered species like I thought I was. So 
But that really got solidified. Going to Synod and being able to have meals with people and sit down and talk and just hear how God's working in their churches, how they're processing what's happening in the CRC, uh, just benefiting from common, you know, just the, the shared wisdom in all these different places within the CRC in the U.S. and in Canada. And just hearing people speak on the floor of Synod, it really became it just became more real for me that, yeah. that that the spirit is still here. Jesus is still building his church. And, and while I believe that's true, no matter what, that, that the CRC could actually be a part of that true yeah. church, um, that that sparked some hope in me that I didn't have going back a year and a half ago. Um, so I, I was just really encouraged by that. And I don't know if I would say it was encouraging, but something that kind of surprised me that I, enjoyed was having conversations with folks that have a much different perspective than I do. Um, people that would be on the opposite side of the aisle and a lot of these major issues, you know, my classes, Georgetown shared a table with classes, Grand Rapids East, right. You know, mm-hmm. we were like the one that was adjoined with them yeah. and, uh, and the week went well. Right. And I got to know some of them and had extended conversations We had thanked each other for listening well, um, not just at the table, but even some side private conversations. So I was just really thankful to be able to hear from them personally and for them to hear from me and, and to, to not see each other as caricatures, uh, but as actual real people. So um, that was another thing that encouraged me. I think uh, another one um, was just that the directness Right. Without being mean or, you know, having to be so elevated and hostile or anything like that, there people were just direct and asked direct questions. Right. So I know everybody has a different line for decorum. And I, I probably was OK with more like emotionally charged uh, speeches. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't necessarily need an NPR voice at the mic to feel comfortable. Yeah. I'm OK with loud talking. Uh you know, I, I work with youth and often to get my voice over middle schoolers, I have to be loud. So I'm okay with that. Um, but regardless of decorum and tone, I was really thankful for directness. Yeah. Um, you know, and I was, I was hoping for that. And I think we saw that. And I know it made some people uncomfortable, especially as we ask questions from the floor for some seminary professors and for Zach King, the new general secretary. You know, I, I could see people squirming near me and even or sighing and sighing and audible. I audibly, somebody said, you know, you, why are we asking that? You can't ask that. My thought was if Synod can't ask it, who's going to ask it, yeah. right? This is, right. you know, it's kind of like ordination. We always assume it's somebody else's job to safeguard the pulpit, you know, well, seminary should take care of it. Well, candidacy committee should take care of it. Well, the local classes in their interview should take care of it. And we always assume somebody else is doing it. So for me, that was Synod's job. And, and I wanted clear answers yeah. and I was thankful uh, for mostly clear answers uh, when we, when we posed those questions to those candidates and for the, the general secretary. So I loved the directness. I think the time in the CRC for, you know, just kind of keeping all this stuff under the surface and playing nice um, is over and not that we have to not play nice, but, but we can be direct, even if it makes some people squirm. It yeah. makes some people uncomfortable. That's okay. That's all we have for this week. Stay tuned next week for part two of Synod Reflections by Hori Naderveld. But until then, don't forget this is Christ Church, and he bought it with his blood. And we've been warned that wolves will come in trying to destroy the flock. So keep a close watch on your life and on your doctrine. Preach the word in season and out of season. And keep fighting the good fight in this messy reformation.